All right, I'm going to talk today about what can you expect as a new Christian. Oh boy, you get saved, or if you're considering being saved, what are you going to, you know, what do you have to look forward to? Uh, well, whatever you're thinking as a lost person, if you're lost and you're not saved, uh, I'll tell you right now, uh, there's nothing on this earth that is worth you staying lost. Okay, there's not one thing that could convince me to ever leave the Lord and go back to my lost life. But uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you and say, oh, it's just the most wonderful thing, blah, blah, blah. You know, you're going to get, everybody's going to love you and stuff like that. I'm going to show you some interesting things here. Uh, John chapter 9. If you recently got saved, I'm going to show you this passage. I'm going to do kind of an expository study. I mean, there's so many scriptures we could do. I'll, uh, go to and refer to and things like that, but I mean, it's I've preached a, a lot of these subjects and things already, so I you know I hate to keep going over and over and over the same things. I just kind of direct people to other studies because um, then you can see them in their other contexts. But uh, John chapter nine is a great picture of a new convert. Uh, what happens at salvation, and I'm going to tie it into some other scriptures, so uh, it should be an interesting study. John chapter nine. Verse 1, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Now you're going to see this thing throughout Scripture, that blindness, you know, there's the physical problem of blindness, and I'm not saying you're wicked or something if you're blind. Don't take it that way, please. But blindness in this passage is a type of sin. He was blind from his birth. You're a sinner from birth. There is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Okay, the Bible talks about there is none righteous, no, not one. All have come short of the glory of God. Okay, there's, that's there. All have sinned. Okay, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the passage there in the book of Romans. So you see there, he's blind from his birth. He's a sinner from his birth, in other words. Verse 2, And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? See, they're speaking of the physical thing there. Verse 3, Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. See, if Jesus answers them on the physical realm, Hey, he's born blind. It's not that he's a sinner or his parents, that, that and now he's being paid for. You know, this he's, he's being punished somehow, excuse me, being punished because of uh, this great sin that his parents did or, his, or he himself has done. No, Jesus answers the physical, but then he goes to the spiritual and he says, but that the works of God shall be, should be made manifest in him. You know that that's what happens after you get truly saved? I mean, why does God save people if he never intends to use them after that? Do you ever think about that? God will save you and he doesn't expect a changed life, like the easy believism heretics say. He doesn't, there's no change life that's not necessary. Then why did he save you? Huh? Oh, just so he can, you know, let you live your life just wickedly and just mess around and sin your whole life. And then he takes you home and he goes, well, you didn't accomplish anything for me. What was the point of saving him? No, God saves you that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Interesting. Verse 4. I must work the work of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. When you die, you're not going to be working for the Lord anymore. Okay, in terms of earning rewards and things. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Question there really quickly. Is Jesus Christ still in the world? You say, no, he went back up to heaven in Acts chapter 1. Oh, no, that's not true. You see, because when Jesus, or excuse me, when Saul was persecuting the Christians, in Acts chapter 9, Jesus comes to him and he says, on the road to Damascus, and he says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Hmm. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says that we are the body of Christ. Christians are the body of Christ. Jesus Christ is still on the earth in the lives of Christians. Hmm. Interesting. Right now, the light of the world is still, it's still bright. But that time of darkness is coming. It's going to get a whole lot darker. There's still going to be a little bit of light there in that time of Jacob's trouble, but it's going to be a lot darker than it is right now. Let me tell you something. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about that. What's going on there is 
we are hindering, the body of Christ is hindering the Antichrist from showing up right now. I mean, you can just see that very plainly. Any kind of prophetic update or anything, some guy comes out and says, I put a chip in my hand, Christian websites, Christians all over the place, look at that, look at that, Mark of the Beast, Mark of the Beast, it's coming, it's coming, the Mark of the Beast is coming. We're hindering that system. I mean, imagine if every Christian just said, you know what, I don't care. I'm not going to preach the gospel. I'm not going to report prophetic, significant, prophetically significant news stories. Imagine if we all did that. How much quicker could the Antichrist kingdom come in? We are hindering the Antichrist from showing up. But when we leave, it's going to get bad. It's going to get very bad. Verse 6. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind men with the clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. Hmm. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing flood? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? It's an old hymn if you don't know what that is. I know I have some young viewers, and you're probably going, what is that? <laughs> it's an old hymn. Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Um, interesting. So he's blind as a sinner, spiritually speaking, and he has to go and wash so now that he can see. Hmm. Very interesting. That's what happens to you when you get saved. You come to God as a sinner and you say, I don't understand the Bible. I don't understand a lot of this stuff, but I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell. And please, I accept, you know, your death, burial and, burial and resurrection, your death, part of the death is there, the shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So I want that blood to wash my sins away. You come, you're blind, you say, I need to be washed. The blood washes your sins away and all of a sudden you go, and you open up your eyes and you start looking around going, whoa. <laughs> The world's a different place. I mean, what do you think this guy thought when he opened his eyes for the very first time? Did the world uh, around him all of a sudden take on a different feeling, look, so to speak? I mean, he was born blind. He didn't know what anything looked like. You know? Very interesting. It's kind of interesting, too, because when you're a sinner and you get saved, all of a sudden the world completely changes. And these people, you say, well, there, I know preachers that say that, you know, there is no change at salvation. Well, that's because they're still lost. They're still blind. We'll see that later. Verse 8, another interesting tie-in. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that, was, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. <laughs> but he said, I am he. Uh, did you know that there's a change, an outward change, that will happen when you get saved? Mm -hmm. If you're newly saved, you know what I'm talking about. You know that things have changed in your life. And all of a sudden, the TV that you used to watch and didn't have a problem with, all of a sudden you look at it and you go, that's not funny. I don't appreciate that. People go, what are you, becoming a little goody two-shoes or something? No, I just, I, it's, it's kind of offensive to me. And you get people looking at you like you're weird or something like this. You know, I brought up his, his, this analogy before, you know, uh, David Spurgeon, he was second in command of the Outlaws motorcycle gang. I mean, long hair, tattoo, leather vest, you know, tough looking guy. Now he goes around suit and tie, you know, short hair and things like this. People look and they go, is that David Spurgeon? He's like him. I think it's him. And Spurgeon looks and goes, it's me, <laughs> you know. That's what happens when you become a Christian. That's what happened when I became a Christian. People that I used to know in my lost life, and they'd say, what, what, what happened to you? I, I remember I had uh, one of my best friends growing up, childhood friend, and uh, he said, so what are you up to? I said, uh, well, I'm uh, studying the Bible and just uh, really you know, researching a lot of scriptural subjects. And he laughed. He started laughing, and I said, I'm serious. Oh, 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 well, that's cool, man. That, cool, cool. Yeah, you, you know, tried to backpedal a little bit there. But it seems so weird that uh, the Brian Denlinger that he used to know 
would now all of a sudden be studying the Bible. What happened? Changed life. If you haven't experienced a changed life after your salvation, you didn't get saved. Maybe I'm just a carnal Christian. You're lost. Okay? There has to be a changed life. And I see these Baptist perverts, and they're coming out and they're saying, the changed life gospel is a false gospel. You know why? Because they're lost. No truly saved Christian is going to come out and tell you that there's no change after your salvation. Nobody is going to tell you that that's saved. Not one person. Let's continue. Uh, where are we at here? Verse 9. Some Okay, verse 11. Oh, sorry, verse 10. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. Oh, if Jesus saved you, then where is he? Well, the Bible says, Just shall leave, live by faith. I have faith. Show me this Jesus, and then I'll get saved. You get that from atheists, you know, foolish people that they are. Show me proof, and then I'll get saved. I don't know where he is. I know he's in heaven. I mean, I know that. I understand that. But I can't show him to you physically. And when he does show up physically, you're not going to want to see him then, you know, in <laughs> the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Another parallel into what's going to happen when you first get saved. Verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. Do you, you ever have that happen? You get saved and they say, I'd like you to talk to my pastor. <laughs> you know? We're worried about you. I, I think that you're getting into some dangerous things. So could would you be willing to talk to my pastor? You know, he's he's one of the best Pharisee oh, pastors in the area. Verse 14. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed, and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them all. Oh, isn't that a shame? Did you ever hear that one? You, oh, you're, you're one of these King James only people now? Oh, you need to talk to my pastor. And you go and you talk to the pastor, and it causes division. And they say, you know, you hear some guy and he goes, I don't know, I, I've always used the King James Bible. And the other hireling goes, well, the King James Bible has errors in it. And the first guy goes, well, I don't, I've never seen errors. And all of a sudden they're arguing and stuff. And they go, see, King James only is is divisive. <laughs> you know, it's like the truth does divide. Yes, that's very true. Very interesting. Have you been through that? If not, you will go through it. I'll tell you right, right now, this passage is going to apply to you if you get saved. This is what you can expect as a new Christian. You will be called before councils, like Stephen did in the book of Acts, chapter 7. You'll be called before these councils, and you'll be called on the carpet, you know, as they say, these little Pharisee preachers, and they'll say, how is it that you, you know, say this or say that or whatever? They'll ask you these questions, and they'll start to fight among themselves and stuff. And organized religion is a circus without a tent. Actually, they do have a tent. It's called a church building. That's where they hold their circuses. Verse 17, They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him, that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him, that he had been blind and received his sight, until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who, who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? You know, you ever have that happen? I mean, you can be 50 years old and you get saved and you get you truly born again and you start raising a stink and stuff and the religious Pharisees will go after your parents. You need to do something to your child here or something like this. <laughs> Try to talk to your parents or something. What? <laughs> you know, I'm old enough to make my own decisions, you know. But uh, verse 21, but by what means he now, or, sorry, verse 20. His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. 
but by what means he now seeth, uh, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. Why did they say that? Look at the next verse. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the local church. Oh, I'm sorry, it says synagogue. My mistake. You know, just trying to update it there for you. But uh, isn't that something? How many of you out there have parents that are part of some Babel building someplace and they're ashamed of you as a born again Christian? Hello? That's what you can expect as a new Christian. If it hasn't happened yet, it will. They might not be uh, churchgoers, but whatever little groups that they run in, little communities that, that they uh, identify with. And, you know, there are people out there. I'm not saying you, everybody that has, that's saved has to have lost parents. I'm not saying that. I think that there are people that have saved parents. Praise the Lord for that. But I'm saying if you're a new Christian and your family is lost, they might not go to a church per se, but they'll be part of some other thing and they'll be ashamed of you. Absolutely. Uh, verse 23, Therefore said his parents, He is of age, ask him. Verse 24, Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Speaking of Jesus. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, a sinner, now I see because he's saved. He's not wandering in the wilderness of sin like we read back in the Old Testament. Hmm. Verse 26. Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How, he, how opened he thine eyes? You know? And see, that's another thing that you're going to see. False religion, Pharisaical religion. Pharisees in Scripture, the Pharisees are identified as holding their traditions above the Word of God. They make the Word of God of none effect by their traditions. And you can find that in any religion at all, anything out there, including independent, fundamental, King James only Baptists. You'll see that. They will hold their traditions above the Scriptures. They have their church building, they have their Sunday best, they have their altar, they have all this stuff that appears nowhere in Scripture, and yet they will lie right to your face and say, we're Bible-believing Christians in all matters of faith and practice. You know, <laughs> they're lying to you. They're not. But you'll see that thing there. They are religious Pharisees. They hold their traditions above Scripture. And they'll say to you things like this. They'll say, you know, uh, you know, how opened he thine eyes? What did he do to thee? How is it that you understand some things here? How is it that you were seeing some this change? See, to them it seems weird that there's a change in your life because they haven't experienced the change themselves. They're not born again, you see. They haven't had the changed life that comes with true salvation. So they look at you and they go, I don't understand. This guy was like a whatever, you know, and something changed in his life. I haven't experienced that change myself, even though I'm the pastor of this church and I'm, I have a PhD from such and such seminary and I have this and I have that and I can read Greek and Hebrew forward and backward and all this other stuff, but I haven't had the change that that guy has. How did he open your eyes like that? I don't understand. See how it all ties in? Verse 27, another sign of a truly saved person here. He says, He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? You're going to get a little bit sarcastic sometimes because you're going to get fed up with the religious Pharisees out there. And sometimes the best way to answer them is through sarcasm. That's why I use it. All right? And you'll see that all through the New Testament. They're very sarcastic with the religious Pharisees. Because that's the only way to get through their thick skull. You kind of have to break that pride down a little bit. You can't come to them and say, I'm going to be a gentleman to a Pharisee. You can't be a gentleman to a Pharisee. You have to smack them around a little bit, spiritually speaking. Although sometimes you want to do it physically too. Verse 28, Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. Mm -hmm. You're going to get that too. You will be reviled. That's what happens with uh, the modern textual critics and stuff like this. You know, these people, they'll come out and they'll go, I'll, I'll watch some of it, but <laughs> this guy's so pathetic. <laughs> they'll revile you. 
Another thing that you can expect as a new Christian. Verse 29. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. <laughs> Think about what they're saying. I don't, I don't know who this Jesus, you know, I don't know who he is. I don't know where he comes from. He's God manifest in the flesh. He's the one that gave the commandments to Moses. Oh, we don't know him. <laughs> you know. I mean, I've read, I've read systematic theology, and I have a PhD from Dallas Theological Seminary, and I know all this other stuff. As for this teaching that you have, I don't know where it comes from. I've never heard these things before in any of my seminary classes. And you go, well, doesn't the Bible say it right here? Well, that's your interpretation. <laughs> See? Not much changes. You know what I mean? Verse 30. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. He points to his changed life, you see. You understand? He points and he says, hey, look at me. My life has changed. How is that possible? Psychiatry couldn't do it. Positive thinking couldn't do it. Money couldn't do it. Fame couldn't do it. My life changed. Drugs, pharmaceutical drugs couldn't do it. I have a changed life. And yet you're saying, this doesn't seem legitimate to me. Weird, huh? Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. You see? Again, you see the thing of the changed life. If salvation through Jesus Christ was just, it didn't cause any kind of a changed life, what good is it? How is it any different from Judaism, modern day Judaism, that rejects Jesus as the Messiah? How would it be any different from Roman Catholicism that believes in cannibalism, that you eat the flesh and drink the blood of Jesus Christ for salvation? <laughs> okay, <laughs> how's that work out? Uh, Mormonism, you know, Jehovah's Witnessism, Islam, you know, all this other stuff. If there's no changed life, if there's no supernatural rebirth, being born again, how are we any different than anybody else? That's why the false converts preach so hard against the changed life that comes after salvation, that comes as a result of true biblical salvation. That's why they can't stand it. Verse 34, They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Who do you think you are? Hey, listen to me. You think that you're some kind of the some kind of know-it-all that knows everything about this book? You think that you're right and everybody else is wrong? Don't you understand who I am? I have a PhD. I pastor the largest church in this town. Have you ever had that put on you? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Welcome to the world of true biblical Christianity. <laughs> you got it? <laughs> Don't be discouraged by this stuff, brethren. It's right here in the book. If these things have been happening in your life, you're on the right course. You're saved. You've experienced the new birth. I didn't say you're going to live without sin. You're going to struggle with sin for the rest of your life. Okay? I don't teach that. You become sinlessly perfect and you never sin after your salvation. I don't teach that. Never have. Never will. All right? What I teach is that there is a new birth. Something changes. Let's continue. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they ca had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Believe? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hath, hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. You know, your salvation will cause you to worship the Lord. Why? Because you see how He changed your life. It's real. There's a lot of things in this world that you look and you go, oh, man, I got taken on that thing. You know, I bought it and I didn't see the stupid little gold sticker underneath it that said made in China. And, you know, you get, 
I used it for a week and and the and the stinking thing doesn't even work now. I got taken on that, you know. And I was uh, doing dishes the other night and I had one of these little MP3 players and I was listening to a, a sermon and I leaned forward and the thing unhooked from my shirt and pfft, into the dish water and I was yanked it back up again. Oh, too late, fried it, you know. <laughs> That's not, you know, great or I can't rely on the thing or whatever else. But you know what? All the things that have failed me in this life, I know one thing that never fails. Jesus, His Word, it's always there. You know, there's an old hymn, the Bible stands like a rock undaunted mid the raging storms of time. Yeah, it's there for you. Jesus is there for you all the time. And so that's why you worship the Lord. You worship Him in spirit and in truth, you know. So many scriptures tie together. It's just amazing. Verse 39, And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. Hmm. Interesting. Those that see not, those that are in sin, in other words, those that are born blind, we can be born again, we can be washed, and we can now see. And they that which see might be made blind. You mess around with God and you say, I'm going to have my own religion. I'm going to find my own path to God. All paths lead to God. Uh-huh, yeah, sure. You know what you're going to do? You're going to end up being blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. If you understood that you were blind, if you understood that you're a sinner, then you would understand what to do about that sin. But now ye say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. You know, it's a weird thing. There are people that can understand this book, or they can at least say that they have knowledge of it. They don't really understand it, but they can, they can preach this book just like they are saved. And uh, they can go through whatever things, and they can tell people, you know, how to be saved and whatever else. But you look at their lives, and it's just like, I don't see the change there. You know, what are they? Well, they're actually saying, I see, I understand this book. I've been to the seminaries, I've been to the colleges, I've read all these books and things like this, and yet there's no new life. There's no change in their life. They've never gotten to that point where they have to admit, I'm blind, I'm a sinner. They don't go around saying, I'm a sinner. They're not sick. You saw my gospel sermon on that. They have no need of the physician, you see. Blind man comes to the Lord and he says, you know, I mean, what would happen if you woke up tomorrow and, blind, and you opened up your eyes and there was nothing there, just pitch black darkness? And you blinked your eyes and you blinked your eyes. Uh, would you want to get some medical help for that? I didn't say go to the hospital. Don't do that. But I'm saying you would seek out a physician, wouldn't you? I woke up this morning and I'm blind. I mean, it... but instead, what, what do most people do? They wake up in their pride and they go, I, I, I'm not, I'm not blind. I, I can, I can see my way around just fine through this life. I'm fine. I, 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 no, I don't need any help. I'm fine. I got it. I got it. You see, I can see, I see what I'm doing. I understand things. I understand what's going on in the world. No, actually you don't. You're blind. These are the things that you're going to go through as a new Christian. Now we're going to go to Acts chapter 9. If you don't believe me that the blind story of the blind man receiving his sight, if you don't believe me that that's a type of a Christian salvation, I'm going to prove it. Acts chapter 9 verse 17. It says here, And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight, hmm. and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. Hmm. So, Paul there, Saul in the story, but he becomes Paul at that point. He you know, takes the name Paul then. Um, he was blind? Yeah. He was a Pharisee, by the way, too. A very highly trained Pharisee going out and persecuting Christians. 
and he gets blind. And he says, I'm blind. He understood that he was blind. You see how it ties in? Paul is given as our example as Christians today. The Pauline epistles are written to us. And I'm not saying ignore the rest of Scripture or something like that. The non-dispensational heretics will tell you that. Old dispensationalists say only read what Paul wrote and nothing else. Absolutely not. That'd be disobeying what Paul wrote. <laughs> you know, if any man consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is proud knowing nothing. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul told us to read the rest of the Bible. The things that are written aforetime are written for our learning. You know, back at talking about the Old Testament, Paul wrote those things. So anybody that tells you that about uh, you know, these non-dispensationalists, they're lying, which they do all the time. But isn't it interesting that Paul lines up with, it's, it's kind of funny too because it's John chapter 9, the story of the blind man, and Acts chapter 9. Hmm, how about that? But look at verse 19. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. You will sit down with other disciples of Jesus Christ. You'll learn from other Christians. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Hmm. How does that line up with the guy in John chapter 9, the blind man? Is not this he that was born blind? You see? A changed life. I'm going to tell you right now, anybody that tells you that there's no changed life after your salvation is lost. And you mark them down as a heretic, as a false prophet, and you don't watch anything else from them unless you feel like wasting your time and getting out of fellowship with the Lord. I'm going to tell you that right now. Watch out for that stuff. But look what happens here. Verse 23. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their, lying, but their laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Yep, you're going to see that as a Christian. There are going to be people that are going to want to kill you. Okay? Now that's what you can expect as a new Christian. But what can you expect as an older Christian? Revelation chapter 2. You know, if you're saved and you've been saved for a long time, you can look back and you can go, yeah, I remember that, you know, and I've been through that stuff. I've been st I'm still going through it, you know, and you will. You'll still get rejected. You'll still get put down and mocked and whatever else. And people questioning you. And I'd like you to talk to my pastor. I think you believe some dangerous stuff. And yeah, mm -hmm. you know, you're still going to get some of that. But here's a little admonition to you, a uh, little instruction in righteousness for you if you're a Christian that's been saved for a while. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. And hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Now look at this, verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Hmm. When you get saved, you understand the love that Jesus Christ has for you to die on the cross to pay for your sins. And you will be very fervent, like Paul did. He's sitting around with the disciples and he's learning, and all of a sudden he's just like, okay, enough learning. i got to get out and preach Jesus Christ. You get genuinely saved and you have that changed life and people are going, what happened to you? The Lord's going to give you all kinds of great opportunities to witness for Him when you first get saved. You're going to be just like, you know, because all of a sudden you're looking different, you're dressing different, you're acting different, you're talking different. Everything's different about you and people go, what's the deal, man? What, what's going on? What, you know, Praise the Lord. Time to witness. But you know, after you've been saved for a while and you just kind of get it back into the routine of life and whatever else, sometimes things can kind of cool off a little bit. 
And I'll tell you what, the quickest way for you to cool off as a Christian and leave your first love is to put this book down for a while. Stop reading the Bible. You know, it's a uh, very dangerous thing. Well, let's continue. Verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove the, thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. You can remember where it was that you turned away from the Lord. Did you lose a job, and you got kind of bitter at the Lord, and you said, well, I'm just going to go do something else, or whatever else? Did you uh, put the book down? Was there a time when you said, you know what, I don't have time to pass out gospel tracts or put gospel tracts in or I don't really know if they're even effective or whatever else. Or, uh, what was the time that you cooled off in your love for the Lord? What was the time that you left your first love? You can repent. And you can get back to doing right. That's my advice for you. And uh, if you're a new Christian and you say, well, Brother, I'm still I'm still on the, the the early first love time period. Well great, keep it going. Don't think to yourself that you're gonna to get to a point where you've studied the Bible enough and you've witnessed enough and you've seen some people get saved and blah blah blah, whatever else, and you're just reading and studying scripture all the time. Oh, I think I know it pretty good now. I can just kinda of put it down for a while. Oh no, 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 no. And that's why another reason why I am so harsh against the Babel building, the church building thing, because it creates a Christianity whereby you do your thing, your Christian thing, one day a week or two days a week or maybe even three days a week if you're very faithful, you know. And uh, the rest of the week is yours. Uh, that doesn't work. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, you do things according to the first century ways, you say, you know what, I'm in church seven days a week, 24 hours a day. There's no time off. Why would you want time off? Why would you want to have some time where you say, well, honestly, I wouldn't watch this in church, but I'm going to watch it now. How many times have you ever heard that from false Christians? I've heard it. I wouldn't tell this kind of a joke in church, but let me tell you what. Excuse me? And why is it that you dress a certain little special way when you go to your church building and yet you leave, and now you don't. Uh, you dress in casual clothes now, huh? I mean, isn't that kind of weird? What are you putting on a little pageant when you go to the building? No, nothing like that. You see, if you have left your first love, if you've been messing around with the world and whatever else, repent. Get back to your first love. If you're a new Christian, I've told you what things that you can expect, what things will accompany a true conversion. And you're going to struggle with sin, brethren. I, don't ever think that you're just going to, you know, I'm struggling with the, you know, I get, you know, people when they write me and they say, you know, I'm really struggling with pornography or I'm struggling with alcohol or, man, I just can't give up my cigarettes. And, you know, I'm really, I'm grieved by it. I'm vexed by it. Why would a lost person be grieved or vexed by sin? See? Um, no, if you can say, hey, I truly had a changed life. Boy, I used to really be wicked. I used to really do this or I used to really be a bad person. And then, man, I remember when I got saved, things really started to change. Yeah, that process is always going to be there, but you're never going to get to a point where you're sinlessly perfect and where you can just say, ah, I don't need to read the Bible this week. I'm just, I got vacation time or something. Don't ever take time off from the Lord. You want Him in your life 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, you're, if you're still messing around with these Babel buildings, man, get out of them things. Okay, they're coming down hard right now. I don't want to be associated with them. I mean, lost people see me and I want them to know, hey, that guy's different. He doesn't say to me that I need to find a good local church to go to. I'm not going to tell anybody that. You know, I used to make the mistake of saying that. Even as a house church pastor, I used to say, well, you know, if there's a decent one in your area, I was wrong. I'll publicly apologize for that. I should never have said that. If it's not in the book, then don't do it. It's as simple as that. And it's not just, well, you know, it's not in there, but it's not that bad. Oh, it's very bad because it presents, it, it uh, creates that two different characters. The one that you do while you're in church and the other that you do when you're not in church. 
a bad situation. So uh, I hope that that's answered the question. I had a request on this thing. What can a new Christian expect? Um, whatever you're going through, I can tell you that there's no uh, there's no kind of a thing in this life that should that should make you think, well, you know, I don't want to give this up yet or whatever else. I mean, as I said at the beginning of the sermon, whatever you have to give up to get saved, to become a Christian, to become that new creature in Christ Jesus, whatever old life you're living, whatever things with your relatives or things with your organized religion or whatever else, man, drop it. Drop it. Get saved. Uh, there's nothing in this world that is worth you going to hell and burning forever. And I mean, that's that's really... In the end, that's really the big issue. Um, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Um, you going and burning forever and ever. And I know people that I've had dealings with and I've had a chance to witness to them and things like that, and they died, and uh, they died without Christ, and they're in hell right now. And I think about that sometimes, and I think, what would it be like to be in a place where it's just pitch black darkness? And you're down there, and you feel the pain of, of your flesh, this body being burned, and it doesn't end. And you can feel that pain. You're in torment, and your tongue is so dry, and you're, can I just have a drink of water, just anything? Can I just see a, a ray of sunshine? Can I just have just a break from this pain? And yet you realize it's forever. No wonder that there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. I don't believe it's mostly because of the pain. I believe it's because of the mental understanding that you're going to be there forever. And you're going to have no rest day nor night. And the smoke of your torment is going to ascend up forever and ever. You say, well, you know, to me, I, I just, I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for my sins. And this changed life stuff, Whatever. I, don't, I think that's a false gospel. It's lordship salvation or something like this. It's not lordship salvation. Again, lordship salvation, that term's not even in the King James Bible. Yet these heretics just throw it around like it's some kind of a biblical thing that's condemned in Scripture or something like this. What they're doing is they're, they themselves are going to hell. These, these easy believism people that just tell you, oh, just believe, just believe. Just, there's no change. There's no nothing. Just believe. They're going to hell, those people. And they're trying to convince you to go with them. Don't, don't, don't think much about your salvation. I mean, are you kidding me? When you go to a place like, you know, when there's a chance of you going to a place like hell, where you're going to burn forever, there's nothing in this life that's more important for you to get figured out than, I want to make sure I'm not going there. I don't know anything else. I don't care about anything else. My job, my career, my marriage, my whatever. I need to get salvation figured out. I didn't say join a local church or send 10% tithe or whatever else, other kind of man-made junk. I said get your salvation figured out. You better do it. Time is going to run out, and that time is going to come when you're going to be facing God Almighty. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Are you ready for the judgment? Are you ready for that judgment? If not, I suggest you go to our main channel page and you watch the salvation message there. It'll take you through the scriptures, through this King James Bible, and it'll show you what you need to do to be saved. It's very, very important, the most important decision that you can make. That's going to be it. Thank you for watching.